Well, today on Democracy Now!, uh, as we move on to our next segment, we're going to bring you part two of our discussion with Paul Robeson, Jr., son of the singer, actor, and activist Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, Jr. now believes that the Central Intelligence Agency was involved with drugging his father with a mind-altering drug, perhaps BZ. In the 1950s, uh, in the midst of the Cold War, the Central Intelligence Agency developed a top-secret psychological warfare program called MKUltra. After the Second World War, the Western intelligence community became interested in the use of mind-controlled drugs when it was learned that Nazi scientists engaged in similar experimentation. Described as the CIA's version of the Manhattan Project, MKUltra was developed in response to rumors that the Soviets planned to plant brainwashed assassins in the White House and other citadels of Western power. Well, last week on Democracy Now!, Paul Robeson Jr. spoke about a doctor that treated his father who had links to U.S. intelligence and British intelligence. Paul Robeson Jr. joins us again today uh, to continue the discussion. We'll also talk with an expert in psychological warfare who can shed light on the possible role that U.S. and British intelligence may have played in the drugging of Paul Robeson Sr. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Paul Robeson. Nice to be here, Amy. Well, for listeners who perhaps missed Thursday's Democracy Now!, and I encourage people to go to the web for that show or any Democracy Now!, if you miss it, you can simply go to www.pacifica.org and click on any Democracy Now!. But can you summarize what happened to your father in the early 1960s in Moscow, which uh, basically you feel was the evidence that your father was uh, drugged? Well, there's a context and uh, uh, a series of sets of evidences in in various uh, places. Uh, The first is Moscow, 1961. The context was that uh, my father decided to violate his passport regulations, visit China, uh, return to the U.S. to join the civil rights movement, which was burgeoning. And on the way, he intended to visit Fidel Castro in Cuba, He had been invited by Fidel Castro. I know the details of that because I was the contact for the Cubans in the U.S. and was part of the uh, arrangements. Uh, I and, (coughs) excuse me, I and my father were both, so were the Cubans, very much concerned with security problems, so there would be no leak about his specific uh, travel plans. This was right before the Bay of Pigs invasion? Yes, um, uh, so that... um, he, being in London, uh, decided to just pull up stakes suddenly, get to Moscow and make his plans to go to China, and he wanted to go, by the way, to Africa and India as well, but his main targets were to go to China and then to Cuba and then home. Um, he felt security-wise, obviously, Moscow was a much better place to make those arrangements than London, where he felt that U.S. and British intelligence would be all over him, from Freedom of Information Act documents I've obtained, uh, they were. Apparently, there was a leak in London, and the CIA, through the FBI, attaché, legal attaché in London, did find out his travel plans. Uh, Since the Bay of Pigs was scheduled for April 17th, and he departed from Moscow on March 23rd, there was kind of a panic in the CIA to help from the documents. There was, of course, a motive for them to neutralize him in Moscow so he wouldn't go to Cuba and be there when the Bay of Pigs invasion occurred. So that's the context. Uh, He went to Moscow. Uh, If you saw the two-hour feature documentary that was aired on American Masters on uh, February 24th. That's PBS. PBS, right. Um, He was quite active uh, from March 23rd on. I mean, he appeared... uh, at meetings, he sang, he spoke, uh, there was no trace of any depression or any problem. But suddenly on the night of March 26, in the context of a unscheduled and suspicious wild party in his quarters, which he locked himself away from in an inner room, uh, he was discovered the next morning with his wrists slashed. So. Uh, my suspicion was that he was drugged at the party with probably LSD because he hallucinated immensely. 
And in a day and a half, he was more or less back to normal, which is the symptoms of LSD rather than BZ. Um, his description of the party, there were a lot of suspicious kind of people there, meaning anti-Soviet people who were talking about, would you help me get my relatives out of the gulag, things like that. Very disconnected, not normal for, here's a distinguished visitor, Paul Robeson in Moscow, and these people around in the party. Anyway, uh, long story short, <clears throat> excuse me, I made my own investigation. I was uh, fluent and still am in Russian had a lot of contacts there. Um, the Russian officials were very embarrassed by what happened. Evidently, there was no appropriate security. Uh, the party, they didn't know about any more than I did. I asked them specific questions. Did they test his blood for drugs? They couldn't answer those questions. Very peculiar set of circumstances. They advised me, this is a very strange time in Moscow. We'd advise you don't continue your investigation. We can't really help you. Um, better for your health if you lay off. I ignored that warning. Three days later, I had a similar experience. Uh, I was uh, hallucinating extraordinarily. Uh, long story short, an LSD trip, recovered in a few days. Um, that never, you didn't take voluntarily. Never had, uh, definitely not, no. Uh, I never had any other psychological break before or after. This was 30-some years ago. Psychiatrists have told me there is no such natural phenomenon of a one-peak psychological problem, psychiatric problem. So I've concluded that there were two druggings with LSD, my father and me, uh, one to neutralize us and especially with me to discredit any investigatory activity that I did afterwards. Uh, that was fairly effective, so that's one of the reasons for all these years before I've come forward with more evidence. The post-Moscow issue is very important because he was treated at two hospitals, one in London and one here, Paul, at in which he was, um, so to speak, zapped with mm -hmm. electroshock. When we come back from our break, we're going to learn about that, and we'll be joined by a person who studied British intelligence. And interestingly enough, in Odd Connections in the show in the last segment, we'll go to Havana, Cuba, where the people of Cuba have brought suit against the U.S. government for the government's involvement in the killing of thousands of Cubans over the last 40 years through dirty tricks. You're listening to Pacifica Radio's Democracy Now!, We'll be back in a minute. You are listening to Pacifica Radio's Democracy Now!, the exception to the rulers. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Paul Robeson, Jr. in the studio, as he describes what happened to his father and himself, actually, in the early 1960s, in 1961. Uh, in Moscow, uh, he feels that his father was drugged at a party. I would ask why you think that the Russians wouldn't want this investigated, considering this was in the midst of the Cold War, and if there was any thought that the U.S. government was involved with the drugging of Paul Robeson, I would think the Russians would want to make that known. Big problem, because uh, there was a total security lapse. Uh, the, the, no KBG, uh, KGB would want to say, well, yeah, sure, huh. they hit Paul Robeson, Paul Robeson Jr. under our noses in Moscow. Also, there may have been some Russian official or officials involved. It was a very complicated situation there. The well, time. let's move from there to you and your mother coming and bringing your father to the Priory Hospital in London. That's not how it happened. Uh, in fact, the Soviet doctors said the place for him is home where his roots are. He's safest there, too. And that was his idea. He's safer in the United States, even under the noses of the CIA in a black community, than wandering around Europe. Um, they also said he should go back without a stop anywhere else. He would be probably more comfortable, is the way they put it. My thought was if they did zap him in Moscow, he shouldn't be wandering around London by a series of circumstances which, uh, you know, it's a fairly long story. Uh, not only that, they said the one thing that he should not get, this is an anxiety, kind of schizophrenic uh, symptom, so on, shock treatment would be criminal. I mean, they went as far as doctors didn't use the word criminal, but uh, outrageous. Uh, no heavy drugs, no up or down or the kind of thing you do for chronic depression. It's a different, so they do that a lot in England, take him back to the U.S. By a series of circumstances, I went home early. 
And since I had had a, quote, breakdown, they wouldn't release Dad with me to go directly home. Well, that was the downside of having gotten <laughs> this I feel drugging. Uh, long story short, he wound up in London on his way back to the United States, just what the Soviets and I suggested shouldn't happen. And within a week, he was disoriented, came back to the Soviet Union, was fine. Second time around, again, not direct to the U.S., back to, and within 36 hours, somehow, well, not somehow, he was signed into the pri Priory by a doctor whom I subsequent interviewed, subsequently interviewed and am very suspicious of. So he landed in the Priory under strange circumstances. There he got 54 electroshock treatments without my knowledge. How did he get them without your knowledge? Uh, well, again, a long story. They convinced my mother, who was then, you know, uh, beginning to die of cancer, that his only hope was electroshock, that I was all upset, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, they convinced her to give him the, to, to sign off on the shock treatments and not tell me. When I found out, uh, I mobilized a group here and in England to get him out to East Berlin, the Buch Clinic, just in time, they were going to give him another series of electroshock treatments more powerful. So he remained in the Priory Hospital for how long? Uh, just under two years. And you have just recently received the documents from the Priory I Hospital. I got the Priory. And the reason I mobilized uh, the group to get him out is that somebody from England visiting the U.S. told me he was getting shock treatments. Hmm. So within 48 hours, I did something about it. We're talking to Paul Robeson, Jr. We're also joined on the telephone by Mike Minichino, who is an MKUltra historian and looks specifically at British intelligence. And we want to see how the Priory Hospital uh, fits in to British intelligence. But first, Mike Minichino, welcome to Democracy Now! How are you, Amy? Good. How um, are you, Mike? Hi. Hi, Paul. Yeah. Let's start uh, with you just summarizing the MK Ultra program. Again, it's not proved at this point that uh, Paul Robeson Sr. was a target of it, but describe MK Ultra. Well, very briefly, uh, MK Ultra is the code name of one of the code names of several projects that uh, started right after World War II, before the CIA was formed, and continued uh, in full force uh, nominally until the middle of the 1960s. Um, MK Ultra was a project, in effect, to develop techniques of both individual and mass social control that would use uh, not only drugs, but also um, hypnosis, uh, soci in, in the mandate, it says sociology, anthropology, all kinds of different things in order to develop these things. What happened was that, as you said, after, after the war, there was a great deal of fear. It wasn't so much fear of what the Nazis had done at, at, at uh, the Dachau concentration camp. What really uh, threw everybody for a loop was the uh, Cardinal Mincenti, uh so-called brainwashing in uh, the early 1950s. Uh, excuse me, was that 49? I can't even remember. What was that? The Cardinal Mincenti in, um, in uh, Hungary. He was a Roman Catholic cardinal who uh, was arrested and uh, then confessed to being an, an agent of the West in what many people thought was a show trial. Um, this, it was considered at the time that he had been given some um, regimen of drugs and hypnosis and that it had made this uh, uh, a cardinal, a Roman Catholic cardinal, um, denounce everybody and completely transform his personality. Uh, this, we know, the highest levels of American intelligence and British intelligence totally flipped out at the possibilities of this. That plus some evidence from uh, American POWs during the Korean War uh, convinced uh, American intelligence and British intelligence that there were um, operations going on in the Soviet Union. That's effectively the cover story. The real story be, be behind that is that there were lots of people who were talking about developing techniques of mass social control. Uh, that now that the world was in rubble after World War II, we were going to rebuild it. And the best way to rebuild it would be on more scientific lines. And that uh, if uh, psychiatrists and sociologists and psychologists uh, could use the techniques that they, they began to develop during World War II, that potential problems 
potential troublemakers could be identified early on in the system. Um, that uh, everybody would be, as they used to say in the 50s, well-adjusted, and they w- wouldn't, wouldn't have really any major problems. And there's lots of documentation both from uh, Britain and from the United States of people saying, look, psychiatrists should be allowed to rule in their own name and we'll make the world a better place. Um, let me, I mean, the, perhaps the best thing in the world is when, and we'll give you a sense of this, um, there was a new dealer named A.A. A. A. Burl, Adolf Burl, which many people may know. Um, he was asked to become the chairman of the board of a dummy corporation called uh, the Human Ecology Fund. This was the primary agency that the uh, CIA and others used to fund MK Ultra experiments covertly. Um, when he was, he was given a pro forma briefing on the project, he was not directly involved, but he was going to be the front man. And they gave him a background briefing. That night, after that briefing, he went to his diary, and he wrote the following entry in the diary. And this is his, 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 upon hearing what MKUltra was about. And he said, and I quote, I am frightened by this one. If the scientists do what they have laid out for themselves, men will become manageable ants. And that's what MKUltra was. Now talk about the Priory Hospital. Priory, the key thing about the Priory is that it's, is, is it's, it's one of the hospitals which is connected to the Maudsley Hospital system. Maudsley is one of the old, venerable hospitals in London. It is the primary psychiatric care hospital. The Priory, if I'm not mistaken, and Paul might be able to correct me on this, is a subdivision of that network, that hospital network. Um, the psychiatric leader at Maudsley is a guy named William Sargent, um, who was a top brainwasher for British intelligence at the time. Uh, and he is the guy who was developing, uh, with places like the Tavistock Institute in London, um, many of the techniques that were in fact used on Paul Robeson, that is to say, massive, um, was called Paget Thompson. Uh, is it Paget? Uh, I can't remember. It's a specific form of Paget Russell, I believe. Um, electroshock, which completely disorients the kind of thing that uh, that happened to Robeson. Sergeant, um, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, Amy, you had Eric Olson on your show yes, last week. Yes, Eric Olson, the son of Frank Olson. Right who was a government uh, scientist who himself uh, was slipped a drug uh, by the U.S. government. Ultimately, the government has settled with him, even though he was studying this, and he ended up either jumping out of a Manhattan hotel window or being pushed. Or being pushed. Um, Eric and some people that we are working with in London is uh, very close to proving that the reason why his father was... uh, given the treatment that ultimately led to his death by one means or another, was in fact because he was in London talking to William Sargent, complaining about exactly the kinds of things that he was involved in. The Ol- Olson, Frank Olson was involved in MKUltra, and he, just like A.A. A. Burl, was very freaked, it appears, at what he was actually seeing and the project was doing. And he complained to several people in London, including William Sargent. And when he came back, he was given the treatment. So we're developing the case that Sargent is, in fact, the guy who uh, signed the, the death sentence on uh, Eric, Eric Olson's father, Frank Olson, who died in 1953 on circumstances which are actually similar to the kind of drugging that uh, Paul Sr. and Jr. went through. Mike Minichino, who is an MK Ultra historian and also looks at British intelligence. Uh, Paul Robeson, you have a number of documents in front of you. You have the Priory Hospital documents, but also FBI documents. W- what records did the U.S. government have on your father, Paul Robeson Sr.'s health? Well, they had an unusual file, not standard, called Status of Health File. Uh, that file. <clears throat> Excuse me. has a number of entries, some of them quite interesting. One dated April 7th, 1961. Uh, that's uh, two weeks after uh, 
my father, I think, was drugged in any case after his suicide attempt. In view of past exploitation of Robeson's popularity by the communists to further their aims, it is expected that the death of Robeson would be much publicized and that his name in past history would be highlighted, etc., etc. Um, July 21st, It reminds me of Hoover being afraid of black messiahs <coughs> rising. All right. Um, it says... Um, on this FBI document, information regarding Robeson's status of health previously furnished to the state, that's the Department of State, the CIA, the Attorney General, and the White, Hunt, and the White House under top secret classification. Not only is there a file, but right around this time to the White House, all these places under top secret classification. Now, well, this is under President Kennedy. This John is Kennedy. under Kennedy. So it's not all those bad Republicans. And bear in mind, under Kennedy... There, were, uh, there was an extremely uh, conservative faction dominating the CIA, and uh, I am one of those who think that a rogue elements in the, the rogue elements in the CIA were involved in President Kennedy's assassination, but that's a whole other subject. In any case, the people who were the extreme faction, the man who planned the Bay of Pigs, Richard Bissell, and who uh, masterminded the Lumumba assassination, was at that time, March, April 1961, according to the CIA documents, in charge of the Paul Robeson file. In addition, uh, another person involved in supervising that file was James Angleton, an extreme right-wing type head of the then the CIA's uh, counterintelligence division. So the people planning the Bay of Pigs, overseeing operations, uh, special operations, meaning assassinations, druggings, etc., etc., were the same people planning the Bay of Pigs and supervising the Paul Robeson file at precisely that time. In addition, the State Department documents are numbered in order, and uh, it's fascinating that the State Department documents covered my father's entire visit to Moscow in '61. There are 10 successive documents missing between the dates of March 26 and April 1st. The night of March 26 was when my father, I think, was drugged. So why this sudden gap? You can see the numbers. They stop right there and pick up three days after the drugging, four days after the drugging. Um, finally, when you talk about motive, um, the CIA and FBI was very concerned about Dad's return to the U.S. because in 1961, Martin Luther King and the movement he led, which was an independent movement, recall the NAACP under Wilkins uh, was dragged into the civil rights movement kicking and screaming, did everything it could to undermine uh, King. In fact, it is on the record that Roy Wilkins collaborated with the FBI in their efforts to undermine King. So here you have Martin Luther King and that movement in full cry. Um, Malcolm X moving away from the Nation of Islam towards King and Robeson returning. Uh, their nightmare was the three of them, the three musketeers together. That's powerful. So there was an immensely strong motive for them to neutralize dead. Last but not least, the documents that have been refused me by the CIA include things like uh, dispatch dated April 7th, 1961, report dated September 21, 1961, report dated November 9, 1961, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are reports right in that period that certainly would shed light on what the CIA was doing on the Robeson file. As to the British, the Priory, uh, the documents, which I now have in full, speculate on after the first three series of shock treatments that had added up to 30-some, they commented, in effect, my God, we can't understand it. His memory still seems unimpaired. What the hell is this? Let's give him some more. Finally, after 54 shock treatments, I have a letter from a consultant which reads uh, July 10th, 1963, right about two weeks later we got him out of there. He says, uh, it's not quite clear what his problem is, but he seems to be uh, improving slowly. As I mentioned to you, 
I think in the reasonably near future, it might be worth giving a a more concentrated orthodox course of ECT, Mm -hmm. watching him carefully, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in view of the slight confusion he showed during the February and March course that was given to him, meaning that the unusual, the special kind of courses is what they started to zap him with after the normal ones didn't produce the result they wanted, uh, which you just heard uh, Mike Minichino discuss. If you people want to find out more information about uh, your father's case and your investigation, is there a place they can call or go on the web? Uh, There is. I've heard that the FBI has put large uh, amounts of uh, my father's ropes and file on the web and that it's now accessible. What people could do is um, spread the word about uh, why doesn't the FBI and CIA open up the files, the ropes and files that have been denied up to now, I certainly am going to pursue that, that is to retrieve files that have been denied, and going through the system, I intend to go all the way up to the White House to demand that they open up the files. You Uh, know, it's interesting, there's a Human Rights Information Act uh, bill before Congress uh, that the U.S. would open its files, the FBI, CIA, etc., on uh, U.S.-supported atrocities in Guatemala and Honduras. It sounds like we need one for right here at home. And by the way, there are specific people involved, the Dr. Ackner, who, Brian Ackner, who treated my father, was in charge of the case of the Priory, taught at the Maudsley hospital at that time. So he's definitely connected to Maudsley. It doesn't mean he did it, but to investigate the names of the people who treated that, uh, Dr. Ackner is now deceased, but there are two doctors who treated my father here. That's a whole other story, one of whom is still alive. I intend to pursue that lead. And we will keep our listeners updated on your investigation. Paul Robeson, Jr., with us in the studio, Mike Minichino, MK Ultra historian and uh, an investigator into British intelligence. Thank you both for joining us.